Hi, everybody. Welcome to Depot TV. I'm your host, Sherry Jackson, Executive Director of the Depot, and we're happy that you joined us here on Sunday night again for Depot TV. We've been showing you a lot of music lately. It's the middle of our Summer Breeze concert series season, a community favorite and an absolute labor of love for the Depot. It's been so great to see people in the park, to be able to hug a friend, and to hear some live music again. But we don't want everybody to forget about the fantastic gallery that we run inside the historic Santa Fe Depot here in Norman, Oklahoma. We host really fantastic artists that are from Oklahoma, Oklahoma-based, strong Oklahoma ties. And we are starting a new show uh, with Second Friday Art Walk of Joey Frasillo, uh, just opened this week. And her work is lovely. It's nature, uh, it's flowers, uh, ducks, people, it's beautiful. You should come and take a look. She's a highly skilled artist. And so to celebrate the artists, what motivates them, their techniques, today's show is all about the artists that we've interviewed on Depot TV. And we're going to start with my interview with Joey Frasillo uh, back during the pandemic. And we got to talk about several of her paintings. On this show, we will also have interviews with Suma Sullivan, Debbie Kaspari, Connie Seaborn, Don Holliday, it's a really good one. They are fascinating people. I love talking to artists and I hope you enjoy listening to the interviews as well. Thanks for coming. Hello, Joey. Am, How are you? <laughs> Thank you. I'm very Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to have you here with us and glad to have you be a part of the Depot Gallery. Um, first, I do. I have to point everybody to that gorgeous necklace and that piece of dichroic glass you're wearing around your neck because when I first saw you on screen, it was just so striking. I love it. Uh, where did you get it? Do you mind if I ask? Well, I used to be um, one of the um, uh, co-owners of a gallery in Tulsa that we used to be at Utica Square called Color Connection Gallery. Yes. And and we had a jeweler who uh, who made these, and boy, she just sold them like crazy. And and all of us gallery artists had several pieces. <laughs> oh, bad! Oh, bad! It's lovely. Yeah. Um, uh, I have some questions for you. And again, thank you so much for being here, for wanting to be a part of our new endeavor as the Depot Gallery. Uh, we have rescheduled a show for you, haven't we? Yes, you have. It's um, going to be in uh, March through May in, uh, in the gallery as a solo show. It was supposed to be spring, but of course, with yeah. everything on, we had to postpone it. Yes. So, yes, yeah. and I'm sorry that you were one of the casualties of this time that we had to take things down and close down shop for a while. So glad that we've got you rescheduled and that we've got you as a part of our Depot Gallery now. Well, I'm very excited that you're you're doing this and uh, have invited me. That's just wonderful. Mm. Have you shown, I don't know that you've been a part of, and please correct me if I'm wrong, a, a show since I've come on board as director at the Depot. Were you a part of a show before? No, I had a solo show in, I believe it was 2014. So that was the year before I came on board. So I knew you'd been right. a part before, but not since I'd been there. I really do enjoy the pictures of your works. I can't wait to see more of them in person um, uh, because I just, they're lovely and I have questions about them. Uh, first is, how did you become a painter? How has this work come into your life? Tell people about you as an artist. Well, I started drawing when I was a kid, and my mom mm -hmm. was kind of an influence to me as far as she encouraged me with paint by numbers and a you know drawing kit, and um, you know I just loved to draw. I studied it in college; that was my major. Mm -hmm. Well, I also had a great uh, high school teacher that was just a fun, fun lady, and she had an art class, and uh, so. I just my love of art has has propelled from there. Studied it in college at Miami of Ohio. Uh, had to drop out, and you know, 25 years later, I got back into art. And oh, wow. so, and when I got involved with that uh, gallery, 
here in Tulsa, that was that was really a, a springboard for me in my career and as an artist. It just gave me a motivation to create. And when I saw it, it was just I was really excited. And you know, I started building up some collectors, and, and so it just uh, it was a wonderful beginning as a, a career artist. And yeah, it that has to be thrilling to sell the first few works. That just has to be a real thrill. Uh, yes, when it it, is. Yeah. Um, did you gravitate to a particular style of painting or art right away? Or did you dabble in a lot of different things before you settled in? I dabbled in um, watercolor and uh, I, re I really jumped into pastels when I Ooh. was... I finished my uh, associate's degree in, in uh, uh, Tulsa here at TCC, and I had um, Dwayne Pass, who was the drawing teacher, and I just brought in some old pastels, and he was like, oh my gosh, you know. Those <laughs> 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 and so I started taking up pastels, and uh, that was really my first um medium that I really started developing. And then I switched over to oil. Recently, I've been mostly doing oils. and But I've been, been experimenting with some mixed media with acrylic and uh, mm -hmm. having fun. You know, this is a time to be creative. And uh, you all of it canceled, so we don't have deadlines. So it's really kind of a fun, fun time to experiment with new things. And I, I love learning, so this is a, this has been a time of learning for me. Oh, that's lovely. I'm so glad that you've been able to take advantage of the time to kind of explore. I think that's got to be really great. I'm having the opposite experience as we try to pivot the depot and everything we do. We've got we got a lot of deadlines and we're working really hard to keep things oh. going. I, I appreciate very much though when I run across the people who I appreciate that for a lot of people this time is take the deadlines off, take the meaning off. Time is a little bit fluid now and that you get a chance to explore and experiment. I think that's right. terrific. It's terrific. Um, so how did you then become connected with the depot? How did you get introduced to the folks at the depot? How did that happen? I don't know exactly. I got a notice. I, I got a, an email from Nancy McClellan one day and said, you know, we'd like to invite you to do a solo show at the gallery. And I was like, okay, super. That's wonderful. Nice. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, For those you, never know, you never know who's yeah. out there looking at your work and watching what you're doing. And, and all of a sudden, you know, something uh, out of the blue comes up, just like the Depot Gallery, which was one. Yeah. I love that. For, for, the, for our audience who might not know, I probably should tell them who Nancy is. We've mentioned her twice. For those in our audience who might not know, Nancy McClellan is the former executive director at the Firehouse Art Center. She's the founder, one of the founding partners of the Depot and the creator of the Depot Gallery. And I don't know anybody who works harder at helping make a gallery work or looks around at artists and art more than Nancy McClellan. She has been able to identify and bring a lot of very talented Oklahoma artists to the Depot Gallery. And we just wouldn't be what we are without her. She's kind of spectacular. Um, yes. If it's okay with you, I would love to look at a couple of pieces of your work and talk about them so our audience gets to see what they'll see on the website and on our walls. You bet. You bet. Um, if we could, let's bring up Sun Seekers. I really liked that one. I thought that one was really lovely. That light. Look at that, Joey. That made me so happy. Tell me about this piece. Well, this piece is based on a property in uh, a friend's property out near Skyatook. They have 30 mm. acres, and I, it's kind of been my muse. And for a lot of paintings, I go out there and take photographs, and I've painted on site. These, these people have 
bought, you know, one of my paintings and just have become friends and collectors. But this is, uh, they have, part of their property is not mown, so they, they grow wildflowers. Ooh. And they just have a lovely view looking towards Skyatook. And uh, so this is, this is an October field of, um, usually the Queen Anne's Lace pop up in early May, or May to late June, or, excuse me, mm -hmm. May to early June. These bloomed in October, so they were set up against this beautiful autumn, you know, field. So that's, yeah. that's the basis of this one. So that's what I loved. I loved the light and just all of those burning fire colors in that field. That's so beautiful. And a question for you, when you paint something like this, do you photograph first and take it to your studio? Or do you do some sketches while you're out in this space? How do you start? I do a little of both. Um, in this case, it was from a photograph, but I have painted on their property. They, they're always mm -hmm. so wonderful to let me come over and uh, paint their property. It's, uh, they've got a pond, they've got wildlife, they've got flowers, and it's just, oh, well, they raise bees. It's just, oh. a, <laughs> it's just a really okay. great place to be. This is but a place I want to go hang out, yeah. <laughs> I do work from, uh, both from life and, uh, and from my photo, own photographs for the most right. part. Uh, uh, sometimes I sketch, sometimes I, you know, actually do a full painting outside, but um, a lot of my, my work comes from my photography, but I love doing it, doing live work because it informs my studio work a lot because there's so much mm. to it in nature that you don't see in a photograph. And uh, the photograph lies as far as space, and color mm -hmm. and so uh so i like to i like to get out in nature and, and take advantage of being there and i i live in a wonderful location so i'm out in the country it's a rural setting at lake keystone and so there are lots of trees and beautiful sunsets and just you know gorgeous fields of native grasses and, um, I get the biggest kick out of walking my dogs and then, you know, observing what's going on around my neighborhood too. Mm -hmm. Oh, how lovely. That's really nice. Um, a, a question for a piece like this. How many, how many hours did you spend on something like this piece? Well, you know, some paintings take, you know, you get real, picky about how you want them to turn out so they take a longer time and they want them to flow out and you it turns out exactly how you want it to in a few hours i mean that's that's right life is sometimes i'll i'll come home with something in three hours but sometimes a pain will take three weeks you know, it's just yes. <laughs> the more you paint the more the more you want to do your best work and so if it's not working you know you just keep going back to it right so that, that's a tough question to answer i can only imagine i i realized kind of as soon as i said it that may have been a poorly worded question because i think for most artists at least the ones that i know a painting is finished when they tell themselves to stop futzing with it and sometimes they feel really good about it right away and sometimes that feeling doesn't hit for a good long time until they're finally ready to either be done painting or throw it away. Uh, so I, sometimes you yeah. set it aside and, and uh, you know, you, you kind of mull it over and, and go back to it and say, okay, now I know what needs to be done. And uh, right. so that's, that's just part of the process. Nice. Well, this is a lovely piece. Uh, and the next piece I loved as well and wanted to talk to you about was called Going Fishing. Um, oh. I just, I was charmed by this piece. I really do love the colors of the water 
and everything about this young person just made me want to ask questions and follow along and find out where they were going and what they were going to do. So can you tell me about this piece? Well, this is um, right down at lake, the lakeside. I was actually down painting one day, and this uh, my neighbor family was going fishing, and so they were all trooping along the, the uh, edge of the water, and this is Henry who is just the sweetest kid. He's, he was four when this picture was taken. And he had his, you know, Snoopy pole and his <laughs> I just, I captured this, um, him walking behind his mom. They were all going over to go fishing. And so I had to paint it. <laughs> and he's been, sometimes he's my little studio buddy. He'll come over and he'll want to color or uh, oh, that's lovely. Paper, but mm -hmm. he's kind of, now he's in school, so he's kind of lost his desire to come visit me, but uh, it's it was just a real precious, precious piece, precious memory of, of him, too. Nice. It's it's a charming piece. I really do love it. He's very alive yeah. in, the, in the picture and you can tell that you uh, care for him by the way that you painted that. Um, and I just I just loved all how the, the colors flowed, you know, through him, mm -hmm. the red, uh, you know, it just, it just worked really well for me. I love it. I love it very much. When did you paint this? You said he's in school now. So how long ago did you paint it? I painted last year. Last year. Actually, okay. I did it as a demo for another uh, documentary that was done by a Jenks student uh, through uh, Jenks has a film program and they yeah they teach kids to do video work and so this was a video that uh, a young student created while I was painting this so that's available on my website if you really Very want to. Very nice. Right. Yeah. Tell everybody what the website is. Uh, JoeyFrasilla.com. Very good. JoeyFrasilla.com. Go check it out. You can see a bit of a video of her painting that. That's terrific. Um, before we let you go, I do have to ask about the guitars on your wall. Do you play those? No. This used to be my, my painting studio. This is a back room in our house. And as as my painting got bigger and you know frames and, and uh, it just the space didn't uh, didn't accommodate me anymore so we built a studio behind our house so this has become my husband's music room he plays guitar so these are his guitars my studio has wonky light you know that it has skylights so things flicker and i didn't think that would be a good good right. place to filming got it got it well i was just curious you know we like music here at the depot too so if we'd found an artist and musician i needed to know that <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for being here and for talking to us about your work letting people have a chance to get to know you i can't wait to get your pieces up on the wall and on our website uh thanks oh, very much God. there you are hi thank, thank you so much for joining us today I appreciate the invitation. Well, I'm really excited to talk about your work because it's so unique and it's really different the way that you do. When most people think about visual arts, they're thinking about works on canvas. When they think about sculpture, they think about things on pedestals. And you defy all of that with your <laughs> lovely fiber art that can be hung on a wall, but is definitely sculptural in nature. Uh, yeah. So I. I wanted to talk to you first about how does one become a fiber artist? How did that how did that come into your world? Well, it came into my world in the 70s in St. Louis, Missouri. I uh, my uh, degree in stuff and I was teaching is English and writing and literature, but Craft Alliance Gallery had just opened up there and they are still in uh, the same location beautiful and they said we're going to teach weaving but we don't have any looms so i literally learned with sticks and things called a backstrap loom like guatemalans use so i learned the very basics 
later wow. was able to rent a loom while I was moving and doing other things. I realized though that I started going, doing tapestries look very much more traditional, some scarves and that sort of thing. But I realized I went straight to the wall. I have no visual art background at all, uh, mm -hmm. formal in any way. I don't know why someone said years ago, why do you want to take all those piles of loose fire, you know, yarns and skeins <laughs> and they're a mess and create something like this. And I said, I think it's because it's like a great dinner conversation. You get people from very different backgrounds, do this with them and get them around the table and you create oh, something that. permanent, you know, you create a tapestry. So, I was doing traditional work in tapestry after in 1994, when we opened Studio Six in the Paseo. Mm -hmm. I was able to, I was asked to join, there's six women, and yes. they all were painters and that sort of thing. But I was able to move here. I'd always had a small table room, brought it here. At home, I have a very large 48 inch wide, beautiful loom. But here, I was able to start doing very different work. And you mentioned mm -hmm. going to the wall and sculptural. In thinking of all the art I prefer to see and search out, it's 3D art and sculpture. So maybe that answers part of your question about how I ended up doing things on the uh, for the wall, uh, yeah. or even things formed on the floor in, in a sculptural way that stand alone. So that's how I, I ended up doing that. Um, the work now currently in the studio mm -hmm. in your in the depot that I was first of all thank to Nancy McClellan for inviting me mm -hmm. to be in the depot and she's so honors work and is so great with that handling our work. Um, those pieces are all created with just my hand and waxed linen, nothing else. There's no loom involved at all because I started mm -hmm. realizing I could measure it off, find the center point of about six yards and start just sculpturally forming, putting beads on, wrapping, separating them again. So in those pieces, you can sort of see that. That's amazing to me that these pieces, because, and we're going to show a couple of those to folks in a minute, but when you look at them, there's the, they're so intricate and they, they're woven pieces. And the thought that you're doing that all just you and your hands is stunning. Yeah. Yeah. How many well, hours do you spend on a piece? Well, uh, that's always hard. But even the painters will tell you, people always say, how long did that take you? Well, <laughs> maybe I have figured out the yarn I want. And this is all waxed mm -hmm. linen because people hopefully will see in the piece you'll show. It keeps its form, but I can twist it, uh, right. twist it back mm -hmm. on itself and it changes. Um, so I, it gave me a freedom to when I figured out I could do that and not have to have anything. It's technically not even woven in the sense of a regular tapestry like this woven. So, but um, it just opened a whole different world for me. And that fabric fiber, which is linen with wax on it. No, I did not put the wax on it. <laughs> People ask me that. I think it was probably developed for the marine industry, you know, years. So you, you buy it waxed. Oh, yes, yes. I just, okay. just, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's already waxed. But I think it was probably when they mended sails out in the ocean, yeah. it would be waterproof because it had wax on it. And linen's one of the strongest fibers you can work with. So, yeah. Very nice. Well, Thank let's you. go ahead and, and bring up a piece then and, and talk a little bit about how you compose a piece and what kind of work goes into it. Mark, if we could bring up Happy Dance. I don't know if you have that one ready to go. Uh, there, yep. look at there that. Is. Yeah. I mean, that's just beautiful. Where Thank do you, you start? Well, if you look at the very top, those are beads. In fact, they're African beads that mm -hmm. I found uh, years ago. If you can visualize that I measured off six yards and then found the center point, which is right there at the top, and mm -hmm. it's just separated. It's sort of a mess in the studio. It's a real long piece of thing and literally made the yarn, put it through the uh, beads, all the yarn, put it at the top. That's all of the white waxed linen. 
the black and the red are when I pull the, all of them back together, wrap them in black waxed linen, and then tie it in a knot, put the bead, another knot, more black waxed linen around that, and bring them back. So the bottom looks like I've added extra wax linen. That's still the same number of ends, we call it the end of the yarn, as right. it was at the beginning. It's just separated. And those long pieces, if you, you know, a lot of times if you keep twisting on something, it twists back on itself and curls up. Yes. That's what that is. That's what that is. And that's it. That, that's <laughs> amazing. I never would have thought that that's, it. that's what I was looking at, that those are all yes. just one long piece wrapped around. Uh, right. When you start a piece like this, um, do you have an idea of what the end is going to be, what you're aiming for, or do you start playing and let that idea develop into what it finally becomes? Uh, your second point is really what I do. Once I had started this series, I knew then to measure off about six yards. And, mm -hmm. you know, that the basic, uh, just the technical end of it. But how I put it together or when I break it up, there are some pieces – I won't, I rarely have to take it all apart. You know, I just make it happen right. as it happens. Yeah. So. You said rarely have to take it all apart. Well, Does that happen only because if I decide, point? for instance, on the red, maybe I say, wait, I, I'll take part of that off, unwrap it and not Got have it. that. After I look, what, see what it looks like from the top down to the halfway of the red or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So uh, again, I have to go back to something like this piece and ask, is this something that you create in a few days? Do, do you put it together for a little while and walk away from it and then come back to it? Well, it, it, you often, I have, it probably, I rarely finish one in a day, maybe because of my schedule, you know, how life is, gets in the right. way of what you really want to do. So yes, maybe part of it, yeah, part of it's that. Um, but I have completed one in a day when I have plenty of time here at the studio to wow. spend on it. Yeah. But uh, it's, I am happy that I have a medium and working now in this form that I can just play with it and do what I want. Not really knowing what it will end up like, you know? Yeah. That seems like a wonderful bit of freedom to have creatively to just let it yeah. take shape and be what it's going to be. Um, yeah. I, I just love this piece. And I, I do, Thank I want to bring up the next piece, which is all I own, which this one, I just look at that. That piece, if you could visualize that that is would originally, that was an old piece that I had done years ago. That's one large probably flat woven piece waxed linen that's uh -huh. probably six feet long and six or seven feet long with paper added uh those okay. are all little separate pieces of paper and it was here i had it at home hanging up for years and i brought it to the studio one day and just started to morph it to something else it was time for a change and i gathered it up and was looking at it, and my friend Mary Nickel, who, the great artist who was here in the studio with us for years, mm -hmm. looked at it, and I had started wrapping the top just to make the hang. You can tell at the top it's sort of all curled up. And she looked at me and said, Sue, that looks like, I'm, I'll get emotional, the bags I've seen the Syrian refugees carrying, and that's all they have left. Oh, wow. So that gives you the title. That's all I own. In the bottom, we did, I decided it needed to be carrying something in it, but I didn't want clothes or toys, even though that might, might be what they have. So those little tubes are literally cart. Uh, they're really uh, like a paper tube, stiff tube. That is what the wax linen comes on. Oh, so I started say when you take the wax linen. Are. Yeah, they're just little bit tubes. I painted them that color just because of the color. Um, and it's interesting. Some people think they almost look like a bullet, but that was certainly not my intent. And right. um, my great friend, Ron Farrell, who 
can shape anything. I said, I need a, a rod that it literally just goes straight into the wall and then will hang. And that's all I own. And I like that way it shadows on the wall. Oh, me uh, too. Yeah. Me too. So you, that piece of fabric that became the bag, you wove that. Yes. That, that was an old piece of fabric. Yeah. Each, each of those papers, anyone seeing it up close, they were the great handmade papers that I'm able to find and cut them up, uh, adhered them with a special glue. Then I took a, a cray paw, you know, the old waxed, like an oil stick and ran it over the top. Well, it picked up the design on those papers is the weave design. It looks like it's embossed on that. So you can see oh, that. Nice. Yeah. So. That's beautiful. I, I love it. We've got several of your pieces. I just want to let our viewers know there are several of Sue's pieces and we are working on our website at normandepot.org, the gallery pages, and we will have many more images of Sue's work up. Those will be available for purchase. We'll have a couple of pieces of Sue's work in the depot when we reopen for our visitors to be able to get a feel for what these amazing pieces are like. Um, before we go, uh, before I let you go, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about Studio Six and the work of you fantastic ladies for the Paseo, because I don't know that everybody knows that story. And um, I think there's, you guys went a long way toward helping make the Paseo what it is. So tell people about Studio oh, Six. Thank you. That together. Well, in 94, as I said, I got a call. Uh, I, knew, I knew all these artists the other five mm -hmm. women but not really well but i knew their work and they said we have one more spot here back in the in the studio do you want to join us and i said uh yes <laughs> fast as i could <laughs> yes. i also li live near the studio you know and so it's a great mm -hmm. convenience and they said we it's sort of it by the back door and i said that's fine with me i'll be back mm -hmm. in the corner so originally there were six um winnie hawkins Regina Murphy, mm -hmm. Mary mm -hmm. Nichol, uh, me, and uh, who else? I'm blank. Donna <laughs> That's Berry, okay. Donna Berryhill. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And now yes. there, it after uh, for by '99, there were only four of us here, and mm -hmm. uh, Regina and Sue and Mary and Winnie. And the beauty of our collaboration here is that we all did very different work. Mm -hmm. They were primarily painters, but they worked differently. Uh, but we all really just got along well because several things, when you have a studio, you can borrow someone else's like printing press. Like sometimes I take my wax linen pieces and then run them through a printing press and flatten them down. Things oh, nice. like that. I would, would have never even thought of that idea, but th the tool was here and, that sort of thing. We also collaborated a lot of it on some pieces, but we also had a standing thing. If you ask someone their opinion, what do you think about this piece I just did? Be ready for the true answer. We didn't want anybody to fudge. Oh, Sue, it's really cute. No, no, it's right. not cute. No. So that's always <laughs> worked beautifully for us. Now it's um, me, of course, uh, Marissa Raglan, the mm -hmm. uh, woman who's a great pr printer and, and collage artist, fabulous, is here. Gail Curry, who works in, mm -hmm. in caustic, and Michelle or Mikey Metcalf, who's Regina Murphy's daughter. Regina yeah. died a few years ago, and she works in encaustic. So there are four of us now working here. We have a guest artist every month mm -hmm. out in our front gallery. And in fact, Dan Garrett just installed for first Friday tomorrow night his great sculptures. So uh, it'll be, we hope everybody can come out, mask required, of course, to the Absolutely. first Friday tomorrow. Yeah, so that's basically our history. That's lovely. I, you know, I, I absolutely love the fact that this was a group of strong women, all artists with very different perspectives who got together. Mm -hmm. And I love the thought that you were all just brutally honest with each other and <laughs> yeah, how, we, how yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's lovely. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Sue. Um, I'm, sure I'm so I, excited. 
I really appreciate the invitation. And it, once again, Nancy McClellan, just, um, she's quiet and gets it done and is honest also. I come back in and see how she's installed everything and it's always lovely, perfect. So uh, Nancy I is an absolute yeah. treasure. She is, yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. This is Sue Ma Sullivan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Sherry. Sherry. And guess what this is? It's a commercial. Actually, it's a commercial for commercials. We have time on Depot TV and space, and we need some partners to help support Depot TV and keep it going. But you know what we got? We got this platform and audiences every week. And if you sell a thing or provide a service or just want to support us and say thanks, or if you have a shout out or something you want people to know about, you could become a partner in the Depot and have some commercial time of your very own. So give us a call at 405-307-9320 or email us at office at normandepot.org and find out how this commercial space could be your commercial space. Thanks. <music> Debbie Kaspari and Connie Seaborn. Are you there, guys? We are. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for having us. Hi. Um, thank you both so much for joining us for Depot TV. I absolutely loved watching you work. It's a real thrill to get a chance to see the process that an artist goes through when they're putting a work together, because for those of us like myself who are not visual artists, uh, it all seems like a mystery. So thank you for letting us kind of peek behind the curtain a little bit. Um, so let's start with uh, Connie this morning. Connie, uh, can you tell everybody who might not be familiar with your work, where you're based, what kind of work you do, and how long have you been an artist in Oklahoma? Okay, I work primarily in watercolor, and although I've, all through the years I've tried a lot of other things, and now and then if the subject calls for it, try something else, but watercolor seems to lend itself where it's translucent it lends itself to the spiritual type work that i tend to do most and i deal with th with things like um love and in spirituality and women's issues and native peoples from around the world i love legends and my work also, speaking of legends, tends to be kind of narrative. There's usually a little story behind everything. And even though it's not completely realistic, you can always identify what's going on because I use a lot of the rules like perspective and the, and the shape, light values and also it has, you can always identify what everything is. And I've been an artist since I can remember, since I was old enough to hold a crayon or pencil without poking myself in the eye. And I started selling work and entering adult competitions the year I turned 18, which was in 1969. And so that's 51 years, I guess, that I've been doing it professionally because that's when I started also selling works. And in that time, I taught um, a little bit off and on. I taught um, kindergarten through... Um, college age and and I but yet all the time painting and selling has been my main income all through those years I think I've taught for about nine years 
and most of the time has been just my art. Uh, it's fascinating to, to think about because the while you were talking, the thing that I did think about is, of course, you started drawing and working as soon as you could hold a pen or pencil because your father is an artist. So you grew sure. up, I would guess, around art, art processes, art materials, and that just was a natural part of your environment, I'm going to assume. Um, Debbie, can you tell us a little bit about you? Tell us <clears throat> how you got into art. I know that you've done, uh, well, you've done a lot of different things, and I'm just going to be quiet and let you tell everybody all about some of those things. Um, well, I, I started very early, too. Um, my mom's an artist, so uh, I spent a lot of time watching her, and, uh, and then she gave me crayons, too, so um, I, I started um, drawing, especially drawing actually when I was very young and I really loved birds from the start. And uh, so I kind of grew towards doing things in nature. Um, I'm, I'm a, a, I would call myself a realist uh, or maybe a realist impressionist. I'm not sure what, but uh, I, I like working in different mediums. Um, I like to draw, but uh, painting has really taken over in the last few years. And, uh, I've been working in pastels a lot um, over the last few years, and uh, so it's a really good medium for me. It's um, it's really portable. I can take it outside and do plein air work, which is really challenging and very fun. Uh, and also, I've been doing um, still lifes for uh, the the uh, sort of the, the lockdown here. We've been um, just kind of I forage in the pantry and I find stuff in the kitchen and I just kind of pull it together and, and make um, what I've been calling these quarantine pantry pictures, you know, so um, I guess I, I don't know how to explain it. But yeah, I would say nature and food. Nature know. and food. <laughs> I, I really do like your pantry series and I loved um, that you chose to do a piece like that for Depot TV. Uh, and I think the thing that I appreciated the most is seeing how quickly that all came to life. Um, yours started from, you know, a blank page, which I was uh, really interested to find out that when you're working with pastels, you use paper with grit. Of course you mm -hmm. do, that makes sense now, um, so that it really takes the chalk. And to watch that go from a blank page to a, to a finished piece in an hour was really stunning. Is that about the length of time that it takes for most of your pieces? Was that something you did quicker for Depot TV? Well, I set something up that would be simple enough that I could I could do it in an hour. Um, right. This is this is what I um, you know, it's just it's just like three things, three items basically. And um, so I was able to do it pretty quickly. Uh, some pieces are much more complicated and they go, you know, two or three hours or, right. you know, sometimes more. Right. But, uh, yeah, but it was really fun doing that, uh, doing the, uh, the Depot TV piece. I don't know. I, I, I thought it would be a little more nerve wracking, but, you know, once you kind of get into the, the actual doing of the piece, um, it gets very uh, meditative. So. Nice. Well, we absolutely loved watching you work. And Connie, you took a very different tactic when you were going to work with Depot TV and be live uh, because you actually took a piece and instead of starting with a blank canvas, because you're working with watercolor and you've got to layer those things on the page, you did it in stages. So you started with one and once you got the color on you had another of this similar type and you brought it out so that you could work on the second layer tell us a little bit about how you thought that through and what it was like to be on depot tv or prepare to do something like that for people to be watching right i uh watercolor I, it's even for myself it's boring just to sit there and watch something dry and even a hair dryer doesn't seem like really good time so i my personally in my own studio just with no one watching I usually tend to work everything 
time, not because I'm trying to mass produce or anything, but it's, it's because that way I can always be painting while another part, one or two of them are drying. It also gives me the benefit of having some distance from the work so that I can see it, what might need to be done. Sometimes something's going so well, it looks, I'm loving what's happening and I start getting afraid to kind of do the next step. But if I have it across the room and wait, waiting for it while I'm working on something else, then I, it occurs to me, oh, that really does need a darker value right here, or that something's wrong with the piece. And on the other side of that, sometimes something is um, going so badly that I'm sick of the piece. And if I put it aside for a while while I'm working on something else, then I can bring it to, to me. And so that my own studio process of working on th different things at, at the same time and making use of time made me think of that and of how to do it for a demo. And it's sort of like the cooking shows that I know you brought up earlier, that if you, um, if I have one piece and I would work it to a certain step and then I'd have another one that I worked up with two or three more steps then, and I did that all the way through so that you could actually see me painting along the steps, but we didn't have to wait for each one to be complete. And we certainly didn't have to wait for each one to dry. Mm, that's great. And I have a piece here that's very similar to the one you did. And I'm going to try to show this to everybody so they can see it. I do, Connie, I absolutely love your watercolors because I love, like you said, there's something ethereal. There's something very whimsical about the way that you put things together, too. I love the surprises that you find in your work when you start looking closely. Um, and they are, because of the way that you compose them, they are also very spiritual, and I just think they're beautiful. And I'm going to show this piece to everybody now. Let's see if we can get a good look at it. This is a piece very similar to the one that Connie did for Depot TV, where she layered pieces together and got to show everybody. What What is this piece? Can you tell us about this one, Connie? That's called Memory Canyon. And there are a lot of canyons like that around. I've gone out exploring in those areas all my life, even um, from a child up to in the last few years, going out and exploring the different canyons. And I especially like it whenever you might happen to find a, a, a petroglyph. And I, we have some even in Oklahoma, which is exciting. I mean, a lot of people think they're just fine to the area of New Mexico. We have them here up in the northwestern part of the state, especially. I also left a little bit of white across. I have layers of dirt in that that I painted in. But there are also, there's white in there across the top. And that's supposed to be gypsum, like we have over in the western part of the state. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so the last thing I want to ask you both is if the audience watching Second Friday tonight wanted to see more of your art, where would they go see it? Debbie, where would people go see all of your art? Uh, I have a blog. It's called Drawing the Mot, M-O-T-M-O-T. M -O -T -M -O -T. And um, there's a whole lot of work on that. Um, I have work on Instagram and on, on my Facebook page, but um, I usually post a lot of things on Instagram. So, and I have a studio downtown, so um, they can they can reach me. How people want to come see your work? Um, Would they just they, reach you in a message through Instagram? Yes, they could they could right. message me through Instagram, and okay. it's Debbie Casperi with a Y. Debbie with a Y. What about you, Connie? Where would folks um, find more of your work? Well, I have a few things at the depot right now, of course, and I hope they'll go to that virtual tour. And at Sandalwood and Sage and Norman and at 50 Pen Place Art Gallery in Oklahoma City. You can also, I almost always have lots of work on my Facebook page and it's Connie Seaborn Art. Beautiful. Ladies, thank, thank you. you very much for joining us for Art Walk. I can't wait to have you on another episode of Depot TV. I appreciate your time and your talent and your efforts. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, thank Sherry. Uh, and today, we're going to continue those chats with the magnificent Don Holiday. Don, are you there? I'm there. I'm there here. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Don. Thank Hello. you so much for doing this interview with us today so everybody can get to know a little bit about you and your art. 
Let's take a look at a couple of your pieces and kind of talk through them. I know that you'd suggested a couple of pieces to Mark and you worked at it. Which one shall we look at first? It really doesn't matter. They're totally different, but uh, I think both of them are unique uh, mm -hmm. for different. So bring up either one. I, oh, this, this is called uh, Escape. It's oil yeah. on, It's can you see it? It's, I can, it's, yeah. It's oil on. It's oil on very expensive uh, oil arches oil paper. It has uh -huh. a fancy name to it, but it you can paint oils onto the paper. And nearly anything I do on paper has some relationship to the etching press that I have, one way or the other. There's, I, I can't start with white paper usually, so something goes through the press. And in mm -hmm. this particular case, I mean, I could destroy whatever you're seeing by telling you what really is on there. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm having to make a decision here myself <laughs> because, <laughs> because the image is, uh, the image to me is people standing in fog or water and trying mm -hmm. to escape and maybe has an environmental aspect to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I typically am usually touched by whatever is, you know, happening currently in the, whether it's politics, whether it's environment, whatever it is. So this one, at least from my perspective, had a little environmental twist, but what you can do on oil paper, I begin by making these images at the bottom, I transferred them onto the paper through the press. There's a there's a pretty efficient way of taking images um, using some different substances. You have some choice and the images leave, leave the transfer paper and go right onto the press. I mean, go on to the oil paper. And wow. uh, these images, this is what I was talking about destroying whatever whatever <laughs> message you've seen in that the this is actually a bunch of people flying kites on the side of a hill but once really? i got once i got the image transferred then i darkened the images i took out the mm -hmm. bottom i took out the hill and i use uh this is straight oil windsor newton but i mm -hmm. diluted uh, some some stuff that I'm very comfortable with in printmaking, you know, because usually those print the the inks in printmaking are very stiff. So mm -hmm. I use that. I use a uh, uh, a solution to loosen up the oil, and then I can just move the oil and play with it. And to be truthful. I usually don't know what I'm creating until I'm at least 50% through. Uh, I'm glad you said that. That's always my curious question to artists because I find it, there's a really curious difference. Either someone knows exactly kind of kind of what yeah. they're headed for, or they just let the piece become what it's becoming as they go along. And it seems like you might be the latter. Yeah, I'm never, and sometimes it's even more than halfway through. I might be 75%. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't start out with anything preconceived. Now, sometimes if you're putting letters down and they spell words and stuff like that, you're going to do it. But this could have easily turned into a seascape or it could have turned mm -hmm. into something else. Or, but it just seemed to start working at some point. And uh, yeah. I just, I, I like to, this sounds corny, but you kind of like to get into the painting itself. And I like that sense of immediacy and being part of what you're creating. And I would think that I was way far along in this one before I changed. I made the figures dark. I Actually, there's mm -hmm. two or three disappeared entirely. Uh, I took out legs and uh, that was probably the last, the last thing I did. And it changed everything. So wow. this is very it's, good paper and yeah. it's oil on paper and oil paper from arches is relatively new, like the last five, six years. So I like it. 
I do too. When I first saw this piece, when we were putting the, you know, when I first got your images for the online gallery and we were working with them, this one, I thought there's something really kind of, there's something haunting and scary about it, but there's something also a little hopeful about it in that title, Escape. Like, right, are they going to make it? Uh, and But there is something, um, something a little dark and scary about it that I really liked. Okay, so it has a little political tone too. <laughs> a tiny bit, yeah. But, but, you know, I think it doesn't have to be any one thing. Right. You know, uh, there's, not, there's not one particular issue. There are a lot of things to escape. <laughs> uh, I, I love to just put down a title and let people figure it out from there, you know. I love and, that. And it's, it's very interesting. I, I had a show down in Lawton, and uh, in my mind, the three figures were probably strangers that looked a little funny coming across an Oklahoma wheat field. And a mm -hmm. psychologist from Fort Sill came up to me with her friend who was a psychiatrist and asked me if I'd served in Vietnam. And I said, yes. And one of them won a bet saying, I knew that was from Vietnam. Well, how about that? Okay. Wow. Yeah. So I like just having titles and people can figure it out. I had no, no, I didn't paint No particular paint. direct oh. message going on. Yeah. The other thing but I, I love did, that too. Then a piece of art that someone collects or that they bring home gets to become personal for them and they're not trying to fit themselves into the artist's head. I like leaving an audience room. Yeah, absolutely. I have um, a to get addicted to new stuff so the oil paper is new to me so everything i sent you everything mm -hmm. is this oil paper but it's just new and then i'll probably move on to something else Thanks for watching that show. Don't we have some amazing artists here in Oklahoma? Uh, if you made it this far, first, I'd like to thank all of the partners and the people that help make Depot TV possible. And you can see all of their names in the credits and also let you know that you could be a member of the Depot for as little as $5 a month. And if you made it this far, and if you're still watching, just type the word art in the comments below and I will cut the Depot's commission 10% on your next purchase of art of any kind at the Depot. Have a great day. Bye.